today's scripture reading, uh, we have two actually. The first one is from the book of Hebrews 11.31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed of those who were disobedient. The second reading is from the Gospel of Joshua, second chapter, verses 1 through 14. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and enter your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies laid down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen for us, so that all who live in that a great fear, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, or you when you come out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother and my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death." Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell where we are going, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. This is the gospel of the Lord. So the next uh, stop on our epic road trip through Hebrews 11 is actually Rahab. We uh, skipped over her, but uh, we can't completely skip over her because her, her, uh, her story is uh, so wonderful that by faith, she was able to save these spies um, of Israelite. Uh, of Israel. If you don't know the story, um, the people of Israel were going into the city of Jericho. That was the next place that God was going to give them, the next part of the promised land that God was going to deliver into their hands. And two of the Israelites went to check it out, right? They, they wanted to see what they were up against. They wanted to see the people there. Now, Rahab was a prostitute, but she was the, uh, also owned an inn, like a hotel, So if you were a traveler uh, going through that area, that's where you would have stayed. Or if you wanted to appear like you were a traveler just heading through there, then that's where you would stay also. So the the two spies uh, were trying to be incognito just to blend in with all the other travelers that were using that place as kind of a stop. But they got found out. Uh, I don't know how, but they, they recognized them as Israelites, and they came looking. Uh, Rahab, however, um, saw this as an opportunity to switch teams. She knew she was on the losing side, the text says, and so she wanted to be on God's team, and so she lied about where the spies were and hid them for the sake of keeping them safe, and then she made them uh, promise her that when Israel came through and God delivered their city into the Israelites' hands, that they would be safe that uh, her and her family would be safe. And so the two uh, spies gave her that promise. So this is a great story, and I think there are a number of lessons to be learned uh, from Rahab. In fact, uh, I've identified uh, five short lessons that I think we can take away from Rahab. Um, If you have a pen or something and want to write these down, we're going to have them on the screen too. But lesson number one, God allows his people to get into tough spots in order to share his word. So this, first of all, is a lesson uh, from the two spies. If you think about that, uh, they've been promised that God is going to deliver Jericho into their hands, and they're there to scope it out, and now all of a sudden they're in a tough spot. They've been found out, right? Uh, If they 
capture these guys, they're probably going to kill them. So if you put yourself in their shoes, they're probably wondering, why has God allowed this to happen? Here we are facing death now because we've been found out. Why did God allow this to happen? Well, the story demonstrates exactly why God allowed that to happen. He wanted to reach Rahab and her family. He allowed these two spies to get into a tough spot so that the word of God could come to Rahab's family and that she might be saved. And God works this way a lot. He works this way in our lives too. Sometimes we are made to go through difficult times so that we can share what God did to deliver us through that. And then God uses our struggles and our suffering to bring other people to him through his word. I'll give you an example. There is a a guy named Bob Miller who has um, been at Trinity. He was uh, 96 years old, and he was, he was at Trinity from the time he was born till the time that he died. And I got to know Bob real well. He passed away a couple years ago. He was uh, uh, served in World War II. And I asked him one day, I said, do you have any uh, good World War II stories that you can share with me? And he said, yeah. Um, uh, I remember one time he was in the Air Force, but he was getting a ride from the United States to Europe, and he was in a Navy convoy. But he wasn't in the Navy, so he was just in his bunk. And he said these, they, their convoy came under U-boat attack. And so he said he was on the deck for a while, and you could actually see flames shoot up. He said they were in a convoy of about 50 ships, and you could see one, like, three ships up get hit, and then another one that was five ships back get hit, and they were panicking. And every once in a while, the alarms would go off, and everybody would run, but uh, he was just kind of helpless to do anything. He was in his bunk just getting a ride. And he said that the guy that was uh, sleeping in the bunk below him was freaking out. He was losing his mind, scared that they were going to be next. And he said to to Bob, how can you be so calm? And Bob actually was in his bunk reading his Bible when this guy asked him this. And he said, well, because if uh, I die today, I know where I'm going. And the guy said, well, what do you mean by that? And Bob started sharing the word of God with him. He read Psalm 23 to him. He read John 3.16. He told this guy that because of God's promise in Jesus Christ, he too can have that assurance that if they die today, that he can be with God forever in heaven, that his sins will be forgiven. So God put Bob in a tough spot so that his word might be delivered. So here's my encouragement to you. This is the lesson that I hope we all learn from this. The next time that you're in a tough spot, the next time that you're suffering, the next time that you're struggling with something, look around and see if there isn't someone God has put in your life that's watching you, that 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 struggle that you're facing will give you the opportunity to share the Word of God with them. It might actually be that God is, is using you and using your trial to reach someone else in your life, and that's often the way that He operates. He uses us for the benefit of others to deliver his word. So that's lesson number one. God allows his people to get into tough spots in order to share his word. Lesson two, get on the winning side. This is uh, Rahab uh, knew this, right? She, uh, she heard the word that the Israelites were coming. She heard the word what had happened to the last two cities that they took over. And she wanted to be on the winning side, right? She wanted to be on the winning side, so she helped the spies, uh, trusting that when Israel Israel came and took the city, that she would be saved. So I encourage this for us, too. Get on the winning side. Uh, We're in a similar spot in that it is promised that that Christ will return and and restore all things to himself, and uh, we have a a choice to make. We can either be on the the team of the world It says, uh, live for today and do uh, whatever feels good, and if it makes you happy, then then it's okay. And uh, and then there's God's side that is to be obedient to him and to his purpose and to receive the the gift uh, of eternal salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. So we have to pick a side, right? Um, As I was preparing for this message, I was asking a few people this past week, uh, do you have a time when you were on a losing team and you switched to be on a winning team. And uh, the best answer I got was my daughter, Lily. Say hi, Lily. Uh, She was um, a few years ago on a traveling volleyball team. And I don't know if you know that this is going on, but these traveling uh, sports are now scheduling huge events on Easter Sunday. Did you know this? 
I was appalled to hear that they have this big tournament. Their biggest tournament of the year for her traveling volleyball team was scheduled on Easter Sunday, and she came to me and she said, uh, I told, initially told my team and my coach that I wasn't going to be there, and they flipped out. They said that I was, I was uh, you know, letting them down and that I couldn't go, and so she asked me um, at that time, uh, can I go, it was in Atlanta, can I go to Atlanta with my team uh, on Easter Sunday? And, she, and then when I talked to her about this uh, recently, she said, do you remember what you told me when I asked that question? And I said, no, and she said, this is what you said. There are a lot of people today that are going to be celebrating the resurrection in worship, and a lot of people that aren't going to be celebrating the resurrection and worship, and you need to decide which team you're going to be on. That's what I told her. And so she went to her coach and said that, and the coach actually researched it and found out they were going to have an Easter worship service in the convention center where the tournament was going to be held. They were publicizing it. So the coach actually went to her and said, great news, you can come with us, and the whole team will come with you uh, to this worship service. So they went uh, to Atlanta, and they were playing in their tournament, and the time came for this worship service to be held in the conference center, and they went to the place, and there was some scheduling mix-up, some confusion. There, nobody was there. Uh, the pastor wasn't there. Nobody else was there. No worship service, right? So now here, they were stuck again in the team that was not worshiping and celebrating the resurrection on, Sunday, on Easter morning. And so she said, well, I'm not going to be on that team. I'm switching teams right now. We're going to have a worship service right here and now just together. So she pulled up some uh, YouTube videos, some worship songs on YouTube videos and they, on her phone, and they sang it together as a team. She pulled up some scripture and read it. She gave a little message, impromptu message. So... <laughs> So her answer to my question was, I switched teams from those who weren't celebrating the resurrection to those who were, and I brought my entire team with me, right? So, you know, uh, that's, that's a, a choice that every single one of us has to make every single week, right? The, you guys are here celebrating uh, what God has done. You're celebrating his love for you and Jesus Christ, but there's a lot of people out there who aren't. And uh, we choose every week to either be on that team or, or not be on that team. So I encourage you uh, for lesson number two, get on the winning side because we already know how it's going to turn out, right? Lesson three then, the fear of the Lord produces good decisions. The fear of the Lord produces good decisions. If you look at the text, Rahab um, the re what she was afraid of was actually not the Israelites. If you look at the text, she says that the God of the Israelites is the God of heaven and on earth. That's what she was afraid of. She said, whoever, whichever army that God is backing, they're going to win. And so because of her fear of the Lord, she switched to his team. So, you know, I was thinking uh, just in my head, I don't know how Rahab um, found out, it doesn't say how she found out that the Israelites were on the way or whatever, who told her that, but I was thinking that if, if Rahab was right in front of me and she didn't know anything about any of it, how would I talk to her? How would I bring the Word of God to her? And I thought, first I would say that um, this land that you're living in, God has already given to His people. This land that you're living in is going to be uh, uh, taken over and inhabited by those who worship the one true God. And all of those who are enemies of God will be destroyed. That's the law, right? That's God's judgment. But then I would say the good news is God doesn't want you to be destroyed. He wants you to be as part of his family so that you too can inherit this land. That's how I would lay it out for, for Rahab so that she then... Uh, out of the fear of God can make a good decision. And that's, in fact, exactly what happened. But that's the same for us, right? We're living in a land. Uh, we're living in a world that God has already given to his people, right? And God's promise is that when he returns, he will destroy all those who are his enemy, who lived against him, to work against him. But he doesn't want that for any of us, and he doesn't want that for anybody. The good news is that he loves you and wants you to be in his family, on his team, that this world then might become your inheritance, that it might become all of our inheritance 
and that we can participate and receive those promises of God. Uh, so that is the law that uh, God is going to return, and he's going to restore all things to himself. And if you're not on, on uh, his team, you're destined for destruction. But the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is you're not going to be one of those people because of faith. Because of faith in Christ, we get to live with him forever. So that's number three. The fear of the Lord produces good decisions. Lesson four, God's promise brings life. God's promise brings life. When Rahab switched to God's team, what she received was life for her and her family. And then the two spies delivered that promise on God's behalf and said, when, when God's people come through here, you will be counted among us. You will not be counted as God's enemy. You will be counted among us and you will be saved. God's promise brings life. So this whole uh, sermon series, what I've seen play out over and over again, every person that we've, we've looked at, um, that, that that phrase, by faith, that happens in Hebrews 11 more than 25 times. Um, we've sort of been unpacking that the same way every message. And that, that by faith, what that really means is to hear the voice of God. You can say it with me if you remember. Hear the voice of God, believe his promises, and act on them, right? We've been saying that pretty much every week. Hear the voice of God, believe his promises, and act on them. That's what by faith means. So every time you see that in Scripture, you can, you can unpack that by saying, Listen to the voice of God, believe his promises, and then act on them. And that's exactly what Rahab did. Uh, in fact, Hebrews 11:31 says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed spies, was not killed with those who are disobedient. She was not killed by those who were disobedient. So God's promise to her meant life, and God's promise to us also means life. We are called to not doubt the promise of God. Once God says something, it will be, right? If he tells us that he is going to do something, it's already done. And when God says in Jesus Christ, those who have faith in him are saved, it's, it's already done. It's already done. And you're counted among those people. You're counted among those who will be saved because of the promise of God. So God's promise brings life, uh, lesson number uh, four. One thing I want to talk about quick is um, just the looking forward to the second coming of Christ is probably not something that a lot of us do on a regular basis. It's probably not something that's forefront in our mind. But I'm envious of Rahab in this, that once she turned to God and was saved, all her old life was destroyed. All her old life was, was gone. And so it wasn't constantly calling her back to the way that she used to be, right? Well, we don't get to experience that yet. We, even though we have, um, have proclaimed Christ, we have called out to him, we have received the promise of salvation, we're constantly dealing with the old life, our old selves, calling us back away from God's team onto the team that is going to be destroyed and so Rahab didn't have to deal with that, but we do. But the good thing is we are looking forward to the day when all that was sinful in our lives, when all that's calling us back and away from God gets destroyed. There will be no more crying, no more pain. We get to live in the presence of God every single day, that all of our sin and temptation are gone. That is something to look forward to, right? And he promises that it will happen. If he promises that uh, that will come a day when all that is old and sinful that's calling us back to our old life will be gone. And so um, that is what we look forward to together. God's promise is that we will be saved in that. Uh, lastly then, lesson number five, go all in and don't look back. Go all in and don't look back. That was, that was Rahab, right? She, uh, she did not hedge her bets. If, if she was wrong, uh, she was going to get destroyed for helping the Israelites, right? She went all in on the team that she knew was going to win. But we have a hard time with this. We live in a society that likes to compartmentalize, right? We're this way on Mondays, and we're this way on Tuesdays, we're this way on Sundays. We're this way with our church family, but with our own family at home, we're a little different. With our uh, work uh, colleagues, we're a little different. With our friends from high school, we're a little different, right? And we compartmentalize. But God is calling us to go all in. He's calling us to, uh, to go uh, put, invest everything that we are and everything that we have in him. So um, 
if you're a, a poker player, you've heard this term all in before, right? You know what that means? Um, I was, uh, when I was at my brother's 50th birthday party a few weeks ago, uh, he had a cons- casino themed night there uh, for his birthday. And they gave us just a bunch of plastic chips at the beginning of the night. And then we could uh, play blackjack or craps or, or uh, there was a poker table there. So I sat down at the poker table and, um, and I was playing and I had this hand that I was sure was the winning hand. But there was another guy that kept raising me. And so I thought, what am I missing here? And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, the odds of him having a better hand than me at this point are just crazy astronomical. And so I kept calling him, kept calling him. And then the last card came down, he raised me again. And I'm sitting there, and by that time, my chip stack was pretty small because I had bet, you know, every other time. And the guy sitting next to me goes, you might as well go all in. You're pot committed. Which means that if I would have given up on that hand at this point, what I would have left with would not be very valuable. What I would have been left with was pretty much nothing. So I went all in, and uh, I won the hand and and got a bunch of fake money, so it was great, Uh, a bunch bunch of plastic chips. Um, But I thought, you know, that that idea of being pot committed should reflect our life in Christ. And that is that we are so confident in, in this winning hand that we have in Christ that we keep investing things in our life, and then we realize at some point what we have left is pretty much worthless. So we might as well push it all in, right? We might as, there's, there's no good, it doesn't do us any good to hold anything back because the winning hand is with Christ. And so uh, what it looks like to actually push everything we are and everything we have all in, it's called repentance. It's, it's telling God, I am, am sorry for holding anything back from you. I am sorry for compartmentalizing my life. I ask for your forgiveness and I want to go all in. And then God reveals to us at certain points along the way that we're still holding a little back here and we're still holding a little back here. And whenever we become aware of that, we push it in. And that's what it looks like to go all in. That's what it looks like to be completely invested in uh, God's victory for our lives. It's not only a victory that happens when he returns, but it's a victory that happens every single day. It happens when we're all in for Christ. We receive victory over temptation in our life, victory over sin in our life, victory over struggle, and we know how it's going to turn out. We know that in the end uh, we're assured of winning. So that's my hope for us that um, in uh, this text, in the story of Rahab, that we learn these five lessons. They are, again, that God allows his people to get into tough spots in order to share his word, uh, that we get on the winning side, that the fear of the Lord produces good decisions in our life, that God's uh, promise is to bring life, and then finally to go all in and don't look back. So let me actually pray for us right now. Lord God, we thank you so much for uh, the example of Rahab, that in her faith she was completely invested in you. Lord, she went all in and didn't look back, and we pray that we would be able to do the same, that we would hold uh, nothing of uh, our lives away from you. And we pray that you would help us uh, repent of those things that we have kept separate. Repent of those things that we have uh, held back from you uh, and realize that they are worthless without you. Lord God, we ask that our whole heart and our whole mind would be invested in loving you and loving one another, Lord God. We ask that for us individually. We ask that for our individual churches. We ask that for the entire church uh, around the globe, Lord God, that we would, be, we, we would be all in for you. And Lord God, we just uh, give you thanks for the blessing that it has been uh, to gather with uh, the Avenue Church. And we give you thanks uh, so much today for uh, having the Joy Church with us. Uh, we give you thanks for having Julie and Al here to help us celebrate. And we just pray that as, as we sort of go back to our, our separate worship spaces on this campus, that you would continue to do this good work in us and that you would continue to bring the body of Christ together for the sake of our community, for the sake of others who don't yet know you, that they would come to know you through us and through our willingness to hear your voice, to believe your promises, and to act on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I'm going to invite you all to stand and join with me in praying the prayer that our Lord taught us. And then uh, we're going to invite Pastor Casey up and Pastor Uh, uh, Julius first and then Pastor Casey. So let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, Julius, come on up here. Actually, I'm going to come down. So it is such a blessing to Trinity to have uh, Julius and also the Joy Church come and join our family. And uh, this is me excited. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Julius and Julia, so uh, don't get them confused. And uh, they've got uh, four beautiful kids. Are your kids here today? Oh, children's ministry. Okay. And uh, one of them's here. Uh, wave uh, wherever the... There, there he is. All right. Welcome. <laughs> and uh, so again, uh, Julius's position at Trinity will be director of worship and outreach, uh, specifically uh, focused on outreach to the school and also outreach to the community in order to bring people in that we might share the word of God. And Julia is actually a very gifted uh, family counselor, and we have uh, referred a number of people to her, and the feedback is that she's great at it. So if you're interested in and need that sort of service, uh, uh, she's available and, and gifted to do that work. Um, so I want to, you guys just want to say something real quick? <laughs> Amen. Uh, what, a, what a blessing. And uh, it's so warm in here. Do you feel it? The warmth of God's love and his grace and the fact that we're here together, uh, different congregations coming together to worship together. I think uh, this is just so encouraging. And we are super excited about what God has in store. Are you excited about what God is about to do? Amen. Amen. God's going to do some things that will blow your mind. It's just the beginning. I believe that uh, we are really in the beginnings of uh, something amazing. And we are just glad to just kind of join what God is already doing here. And we've known uh, Pastor Vince for a while, and he's been a brother to me. We've had very open conversations over time, over smoothies. Yeah, we love smoothies. So it's, it's been great. And I just look forward to uh, working with... Uh, with Avenue Church, with Redemption Church, with Trinity. I mean, just all of us coming together under that big umbrella, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, amen, and doing some great things because Delray needs Jesus every day, amen, and we are the hands and feet of Jesus. So I pray that uh, whatever we do will bring glory and honor to his name. Thank you, sir. I'd like to uh, invite up just real quick Pastor Casey and Renee, if you could come up. Renee is one of our elders, and we're just going to pray uh, over the Santa family and uh, over uh, Julius as he starts his new role here, uh, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Pastor Casey, who has a great testimony for us. Lord God, I thank you so much for uh, just the blessing that uh, Julius is to our church and his family is to our church and the Joy Church is to our church. We are just so overwhelmed by your gracious provision that in our need, you gave us uh, him at the, your perfect timing uh, to bless us according to their gifts, not only his gifts, but also the gift of his family and his church. And we just ask that that would be uh, just a, a blessed coming together for your purpose, that uh, in, in that, Lord, you would be glorified and that in that uh, more people would come to know you. There, Lord, there are people out there right now that don't know you and will come to know you because of this collaboration and partnership. And we just give you thanks for that and ask for your blessing that that, that might come about. And we pray for just well-being for Julius and his family, that, that you would provide for them in every way that they need. Keep them in your hands during this time of transition and just let them uh, feel our collective arms around them and your hands around them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kind of feels like it should be over, right? <laughs> like, why is this scrawny guy up there again? Well, listen, <laughs> it's not over, okay? It's not over. <laughs> but I've got my phone, so we're almost there. We're almost there. <laughs> so I think I'm supposed to, uh, and I'm going to say this at the front, so that if I ever um, 
start to shrink back from it. I will have already said it. And you know when you say something, then you're all in, right? Like Vince said, go all in. So I'm just going to say it at the front, and then, you know, when stuff maybe starts kind of going on inside, it'll keep pushing me. Um, if you can relate to that, just, just nod your head so I'm not the only one who, yeah, okay, cool, great. Um, I think I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to um, uh, tell you guys a bit about the heart of God in this testimony. I think I'm supposed to tell you a bit about the heart of God. And if that's what God wants me to do during these last 10, 12 minutes, then I'm just going to go for it, okay? Cool. All right. Great. Hebrews 11.31, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. That's what Vince just preached. So I asked one of my favorite theologians, local guy, you know him, he was just on the stage, Pastor Vince. I said, Pastor Vince, what is it that's going to be the main uh, message? What's the main point of where you're going here with, uh, with, this, with this particular uh, Sunday? As I'm giving the testimony. Um, so I'd like to know. And quote, Pastor Vince, God's word saved her because she responded with faith. So it made me ask the question, could it be? Could it be that God is still saving as we respond by faith? Is the same God of Rahab the God that is present and available here today but the way that we took this opportunity to give testimony was not that you would hear how this is working out in my life, but how this is working out in our life. These next few moments is a testimony of the capital C church, not just one individual in the capital C church. And so I want to ask the question again, is it possible that God, as his people respond by faith, is he still saving is he still on the move? So the answer, of course, I believe, is yes. You might ask, well, what, what is the faith of the church? What is it that we need to respond to in faith or, or, or repent or join the winning team? Now, please don't misunderstand me before I move through that, that answer. I am not saying that the, the church... Uh, needs anything. I'm not saying um, that the church will not prevail against the gates of hell. Jesus has already promised us that. But in a particular degree, and from a particular perspective, the church has struggles. The report on the church, depending on where you are and what part of the world you live, the report on the church is not always glowing and positive. So is it potentially true that God is going to do something radically beautiful as the church responds by faith to the prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17. Jesus in John 17 prays this specific prayer, and this is what he says. He says, Father, I'm not just praying for my disciples, but I, I don't only ask for them, but I also ask for those who uh, will believe in me. That's you. That's me. Uh, through, through their word, that's the apostles, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I'm in you, so also may they be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then he goes on to say, so that as the world looks, the world will not only believe that the Father sent the Son, but the world will, gin, will begin to believe that you, Father, love the world like you've loved me, the Son. So here's Jesus' prayer. From this point forward, that the church would begin to function like the family that God has called it to be. This is not a movement of sameness. This is not a movement of looking alike and thinking alike and, and having to um, speak alike and have uh, no preferences. This is not about sameness. This is about togetherness. This is about the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ is stronger and triumphs over all of our distinctives and our agendas and our preferences. And at the end of the day, we get to look at one another and say, that's my brother and that's my sister and I'm going to give my life to figure out how it is we live this out together. So what does this look like in this area? 
and then I'll finish by talking about what this has looked like here in Delray Beach. Um, you might be familiar with a movement called Church United. Church United was a movement started a few years ago um, where it is uh, basically a collection of churches who has decided to do just that, respond in faith to the prayer of Jesus that we might be one for the sake of mission. It's not a movement of churches that come together. It's just so we can like um, uh, increase friendship or, or um, have, have more fellowship groups. Or It's not for unity's sake. It's for mission. It's because Jesus prays, and when Jesus prays something, I think you should really lock in, especially when there's a result. Jesus prays that they might be one so that the world would know you sent me, so that the world would know you love them like you've loved me. So here's what Jesus is saying. Like the great gospel strategy is that the church would figure out how to be family and love one another well and move forward together. That's it. Not a, not a better evangelical tool, not more crusades, not more programs. That the church would learn to fall in love with one another, Father, as you have loved me. That is when the world will be like, wow, that bride is beautiful. I can't take my eyes off of what's going on there. I sat down with another pastor up in West Palm, leads a big church, and I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to give you my interpretation of what he said about what some of the things we're doing. You're crazy. Tell me more. <laughs> church United is just simply a collection of churches that have decided to come together for the sake of mission, believing that people are going to go from death to life because we decided to link arms and do this thing like a family. What is it that um, we've been doing in this sort of Church United movement? Now, it's a, it's a movement that has come into both Broward County, Palm Beach County, and even up here a, a little bit further than us. There's three areas that Church United seeks to move into strategically. They seek to move into the lostness, the brokenness, and the pain of the cities where they have come. The lostness, the brokenness, and the pain. So the lostness is all about seeing people understand who Christ is. The lostness is all about the gospel message. The fact that we are all sinners and have no hope outside of Christ. That we are under the wrath of God, rightfully so. And if God in his love doesn't do something for us in Christ, we have no shot and we'll spend eternity in hell apart from God. They said, we're going we to do something about that because there's a God who has a message of love that is for sinners like you and sinners like me. And so the first order of business of Church United is to figure out how is it that we take this message of love? How is it that we take the fact that Christ died for our sin, for my sin, for your sin? That he was buried and on the third day he overcame sin and he overcame death. And by faith, by repentance, by joining the winning team, by believing in Christ's finished work, you can be forgiven. How is it that we are taking that message to the people? Well, that's the first order of business of Church United, the lostness. The second one is the brokenness. And so Church United has been seeing churches come together to enter into the, the brokenness of the cities that we find ourselves in. Primarily, this has been through the education system, reading program in Broward County, and for us, it's been a lot of foster care work. There's been a lot of foster care expression of this. And then finally, the pain. The pain. How is it that the church, not just one church, but the church can enter in to the pain of the cities where they are. And you may be hearing more about how the church can enter in more significantly to the pain of addiction here in Delray Beach as we move forward. Well, so what does this look like for us here in Delray Beach? What, what has the expression been for us? Let me tell you just uh, before I do that, really cool story. Um, the way that Church United responded in Broward County when there was a shooting at the Fort Lauderdale Airport this is just an example of what it means to enter into the pain when we come together. There were a bunch of people who were hospitalized uh, from that incident. So Church United gathered all the churches, took up an offering, and paid the bill for everyone who was in uh, the hospital and was able to then express this comes from the love of God uh, and, and, and how we've been changed. Okay, and so, so it's not just churches talking about it. It's churches actually doing something to enter into these three areas. And so this is, this is kind of where I'll close so that 
so that you understand this is happening here. I mean, in the, in the Tri-County, there's over 120, there's about 125 churches that are involved in this movement. And the reason that I'm telling you about this movement is because it had significant influence as to what has been happening here in Delray Beach between the churches that you know, especially Trinity uh, and, and the Avenue. Churches like Calvary, Spanish River, St. Paul, Christ Fellowship, Journey Lake Worth, um, Trinity Lutheran, Redemption, The Av, Coral Ridge, Generation Church, City Church, Fort Lauderdale, just to name a few. Just so you have an idea, these are some of the churches that have partaken in some degree in the Church United movement. And now here's, here's where we finish as to what this means for you and me and, and what's been going on and, and why it's been so sweet. So Vince... Was, was really clear when, um, and he's, he's been clear as he's told the story about our relationship. And he said, we didn't want a, uh, we didn't want a renter, we wanted a partner in the ministry. We wanted somebody who we, we could do John 17 with. And, um, you know, that, that's just, that's just been singing in our hearts at the Avenue Church. And to see a church that's over 100 years old come and say, hey, we want to open our doors and we want to be generous with what God has given us and, and invite you into this journey because we think that we can do it better together was just like an encouragement, like crazy to our hearts as it has been. Some of the things that we've been celebrating as, as we've come together. The whole idea of putting the friendship first, these are some of the things that God has done because we've decided to put the friendship first and really seek out the heart of God as it pertains to churches coming together. Since we moved our offices here, we've also then thus moved our, our worship service here. Between the two churches, we've seen over 50 baptisms in that time. I asked Mitch specifically, since we moved our offices here, now, those, those baptisms are both children and, and adults. For us, since we moved our, church, our, 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 our offices here, how many baptisms have we seen? How many professions of faith? People coming forward in baptism publicly saying, I'm following Jesus. And the number was 38. So I want to say that there's been at least 38 people and more who are saying thank you for seeking after the heart of God because they're the so that. They're the soul that people would know God loves them like he loves his son. I want to say that we've um, done FPNO now, and we, we average about 25 foster children who come into this very place where you are. And they're served because two churches are saying, hey, we're going to open our doors and we're going to do this together. And it's more than two churches. But recently, that's, that's our number that we've been averaging. And there's 25 foster children and their parents who are saying, thank you for responding by faith to what Jesus has prayed. As we've done Love Del Rey, we've been able to serve 10 nonprofits. Five local churches at least have been involved in that. There are over 50 to 60 children right now who are saying, thank you, Trinity Lutheran. Thank you, Avenue Church, for responding in faith to the prayer of Christ. Because now we're experiencing this church together. There were over 70 kingdom students here on Friday night who would say thank you for responding in faith because you created a context for us to come and hear about the love of Jesus Christ. Finally, we've been doing this epic road trip, right? And we've been together and, um, you know, it's not always easy. When you make a decision, you're not always sure you made the right decision even when you're in this decision. You know, you can, you can be in it and you're like, oh man, I, oh, I think this was good. And the, but you're not always sure. And there was a Sunday where I was like, man, I, I think it was, but I don't know. And I was kind of like, you know, a little bit back and forth. And one of the most beautiful things about being together as the church is that we got to take off the, the, um, the title Trinity Lutheran and you got to take off the title The Avenue Church and you got to see that we were people with names and stories and hearts like, it's not just Trinity Lutheran, it's actually Joe. Joe, the greeter back there, who I, I, I don't know, I don't know Joe. He's, he's, a, just a, he's a little bit older than me, so I think he's walked with the Lord for, for longer than I have, but he grabbed me 
in one of the services where I was a little bit up in my head and he hugged me and he said, thank you. And it was as if the Lord like lifted the veil and reminded me, I'm in this man, this is my heart. And as one of our leaders said, from this particular corner in Del Rey, he's believing God's gonna change the world. So I invite you to continue to believe that with us. Believe that God is gonna change the world as we respond in faith and keep doing the next right thing. I'm gonna ask Julie to come up and we're gonna close um, by doing what we believe we've been doing the whole time, which is worshiping Jesus. This whole thing, the sweetness of this whole thing, the fragrance of this whole thing comes because it's to make much of Jesus' name. And so we're gonna continue looking to Jesus at this time. I'm gonna invite the prayer team to come up. And if you want prayer over anything, we'd love to be able to, to pray for you, ask the Lord's blessing and favor upon you, ask for healing, ask for restoration, ask for guidance, whatever it is that you might be. Ask that God would help you to continue in your repentance as Vince talked about as you follow Jesus. We'll also have an opportunity to respond back there with the offerings for Trinity uh, and attendance and Avenue Church back there as well at that table where Joe, Joe, can you raise your hand? That's the Joe that hugged me, right there he is. And we're just gonna allow you to respond to this song however you feel like the Lord wants to meet you. You might stand and sing, you might sit and let it wash over you, you might come for prayer, we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and, and be with us as, as Julie sings.